Um, so welcome everybody to um, Introduction to eBird, Making the Most of Global Big Day with eBird, Caribbean, and Merlin. Um, we're really super excited to have you with us for what will be a super interesting webinar. So I'm just going to take two seconds to tell you a little bit more about Birds Caribbean in case you're not familiar with us. Uh, we are a regional nonprofit and we're dedicated to the conservation of Caribbean birds and their habitats. And our mission is to uh, work together with our partners and raise awareness, promote sound science, and empower our uh, local people and our partners to build a region where people appreciate and conserve and benefit from thriving bird populations and ecosystems. Next slide, Jeff, thanks. Okay, so right now we are in the middle of our Caribbean Endemic Bird Festival. And this festival is celebrated for one month in the spring. And the goal of this festival is to increase awareness and appreciation of the re region's unique birds. There's actually 171 species of birds that exist in the Caribbean and nowhere else in the world. So normally this time of year, we have volunteer educators and coordinators that are organizing all kinds of fun birding events. Um, but due to the pandemic, we can't get out. Um, so next slide. We have organized what we're calling Caribbean Endemic Bird Festival from the Nest, and it's our virtual edition. So every day on our website, we've been posting um, fun free resources. We have an endemic bird of the day. We have free coloring pages, online bird puzzles, crosswords, eBooks, nature activities, and much more. So be sure to visit us on our website. You can look under the resources menu on our website or you can use that bit.ly link and we'll paste it again in the chat window. And also follow us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter because we're posting there as well. So uh, as you all know, Global Big Day is this Saturday. It's uh, the biggest day of birding on the whole planet and the Caribbean and the USA and everybody is participating, we hope. So um, this Global Big Day, we've decided to really step it up and um, form teams and make a fundraiser to help um, Birds Caribbean science and conservation programs. So some of you, I think, on this webinar have already joined one of our teams. If you haven't, you're, everybody's welcome to join us. You can join one of the eight teams that's already formed, or you can simply support us by making a donation. So uh, look on our social media, our website, and you can, um, Go to the GoFundMe page and uh, find out how to join. There's a bit.ly link at the top of the page there. So make note of that and we'll also put that in the chat window. Next slide. All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Um, one of my favorite people in the world, Jeff Gerbracht. Um, Jeff has been a bird nerd since the age of nine. And um, I first met him in 2007 in Puerto Rico at our international conference. And we have been working together closely ever since then. Um, Jeff has done, I don't know how many workshops with us. He's come to all of our conferences and given talks and training workshops. Um, he's done surveys with us, especially with post-hurricane um, assessments of bird populations and how they're doing. For example, in Barbuda with the Barbuda warbler. And um, Jeff also completed the first edition of the Checklist of the Birds of the West Indies. He led a group doing that. So um, Jeff is just an all around knowledgeable, awesome guy. And, um, and I think you're in for a treat with our webinar today. So uh, without further ado, Jeff, take it away. Thanks, Lisa, for those kind words. Um, and uh, the Caribbean's always had a special place in my heart. Um, there's a, not only for the birds, but for the, the people and the food and just everything about it. It's just, uh, uh, I, I can't wait to get back, back down there um, once, the, uh, once we're allowed to travel again. But I'll get started here. Um, starting with uh, pictures of a few images or a few pictures of birds. I mean, who doesn't like birds in a, in a presentation? Um, feel free also to, to, if you know what some of these birds are, to go ahead and enter them in the chat window. Um, got what some of these are. This one's a little more challenging. Um, but I'm really including these pictures for, uh, for a different reason as well. Um, these birds are really, in my mind, why we're here this afternoon. Um, 
bit uh, jumping around here. We really enjoy seeing them, observing their wonderful behaviors, and, and I think we're all concerned about the future of, of these birds and bird populations around the world. And that, to me, that's really why Birds Caribbean and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology exist. So I, I work at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology as a software developer, even though my passion is birds. And um, bird conservation and these birds are really why we've collaborated on this, these two projects, eBird and Merlin, that, that we'll be talking about today. And it's also why Global Big Day exists. Uh, it's there both to raise awareness in birds and the peril of the many populations that they're facing, uh, to get us outside looking at birds. And almost, or I would say even more importantly, is to gather data around the globe. That, um, there's a quote I really like from a Brazilian eBirder early on in the Global Big Day. He said, watching the totals come in that you can see here in this example, was as exciting as watching a World Cup match. Um, that's pretty high praise coming from a Brazilian when I when, uh, realize how passionate they are about their, their football. So eBird itself, it's about you, it's about me, it's about everybody who uh, goes out and looks at birds. Um, this is a graphic showing um, eBird observations around the world. So every pinpoint of light that you see here is where somebody entered a checklist of birds into eBird. So Global Big Day really is global. Um, I want to start off uh, talking a little bit about the history of eBird. Started in 2002, um, and since then we've had very steady growth in both number of observations of individual species and, and checklists coming in from from around the globe. Um, I think some of these slides take a little bit of delay, so I apologize if I, if I speak before the slide appears for you. So I'll, I'll try, to, try to sync that up a little better. Um, we've had 500 plus million eBird visitors um, in the last year. 10% of those who have contributed to data, over 500,000 people have, have contributed data to eBird. We're approaching 800 million observations, uh, have observations of just about every species in the world, and almost 52 million hours of field time have, have been volunteered in looking at birds around the globe. So what do we do with all of those data? Um, one of the things is, is we try to visualize and figure out what's, what's happening with bird populations. And to me, that's, that's really, the, uh, the, the goal of the whole eBird project. Uh, the visualization I'm showing here, each one of these dots is the geographic center of a species on a single day. So what we're seeing here is the migration of, I can't remember, 100 plus species throughout the year. And again, these dots are just the center. Some of them very rapidly go from South America all the way to the, to the Arctic nest and within uh, three weeks turn around and, and go back south, whereas other populations move, move much more slowly. We look at this map and we think, wow, there's a lot of data in eBird, right? But if we zoomed in on this map, and even in the US where, where we have most of the, the white dots, um, there would be large areas where there aren't any bird lists. As you zoom in, it would start to look like uh, Brazil and South America or, or even Africa or Asia. Uh, so what we really need to do though to, to begin to understand what bird populations are doing so that we can read not me, other people can apply this information for conservation is we really need to have a much finer center of the population of a, of a species that is showed on that on that previous previous uh, a map. So to fill those gaps in coverage, uh, there are a group of scientists that are developing models. Uh, so they're modeling the abundance and distribution of species and the changes in that abundance over time. So when we think about where do birds occur and when they occur, often we'll go to a field guide and we'll see a map that looks very similar to this. So this is a map of least grebe and um, 
probably one of the better maps out there that shows the distribution of least grade. But this really doesn't have the information needed to begin to think about on the ground conservation. So we're taking that EBER data and modeling, com um, combining it with habitat and satellite imagery and, and a bunch of different data sets that are available now. And we're actually modeling the relative abundance of least grebe throughout its entire range for the entire year. So the darker purple areas are areas where the, they have a high, much higher relative abundance. And um, so when you compare these two maps, you begin to realize that maybe we're reaching the point where we really can do conservation based on, on, on the information coming out of EPER. So not only can we model um, sedentary species like least grebe, we can begin to look at uh, migratory species as well. So this is Antillean nighthawk, which breeds in the West Indies, but you might notice that there's really nothing on the map for where they are in the winter. And with this nighthawk, when they don't vocalize, and they vocalize mostly in the breeding season, they're almost impossible to separate from common nighthawk. So there's very few non-breeding observations and certainly not enough to be able to generate models. So the more observations we can gather, the more insights we can begin to get into these, these bird populations and what they're doing. Here's another migrant. The, these are again modeled results from, from eBird data, data contributed by people just like you and me. Um, if you have a guess as to what the species might be, go ahead and type it in the chat window. I think uh, Lisa and Jessica uh, know what it is already, but it's a species you can see that winters almost exclusively in Cuba and Hispaniola in the Bahamas, uh, with some in Jamaica, Puerto Rico, and, and even in the Yucatan. And then it migrates and spreads out throughout the Canadian forest during the, the breeding season. So this is Cape May warbler. Um, I think most people in North America may not even realize that it winters in such a tiny area in the West Indies and how important the West Indies are for, for the conservation of, of, of even some of these North American species. So you think about these models, <clears throat> and most of those models were, were generated from multi-year data. We can begin to also um, model year by year, which allows us to begin to look at trends. How is the population doing over time? And in this case, it's a ruby crown kinglet, which is a North American species that migrates from the northern U.S. down to the southern U.S. Um, for winter. And this is showing a relative change in their abundance between 2007 and 2016. Um, unfortunately, red is not good. Um, the more intense the red is, the stronger the change that we're seeing here. So we're seeing a definite decline in this species, even, even from the citizen science data that we, we get from Uber. Um, kind of uh, showing something a little more complex, this is Baltimore Oriole. Um, we can see that it's decreasing in the east, which is the traditional heart of its breeding range, but it seems to be increasing in the, west, in the western part of its uh, range. And part of that is because it's slowly expanding to the west and it seems to be doing pretty well as it, as it moves west. Um, I think we're going to intersperse some quizzes in here. I, I think Lisa has, uh, knows how to get this started, right, Lisa? But uh, a question for everybody. When did Ebert start? I'm going to see how many people were, were, uh, have, have been awake through the whole thing. Uh, 1897, I wish it started then. That would be great. Numbers coming in. Most people are looking at 2002. All right, only, come on, keep voting people. 1998. Nobody's picked 2049 yet, huh? <laughs> Back to the future. Right. All right, five more seconds. Four, three, two, one. All right, I'll show All right. you. There we go. Very good. 2002. Um, I started the lab in 2001. It's it's been a it's been a real fun fun project to work on over the years. So I want to 
dive a little bit more into on the ground conservation. And, and we have those models which look really nice. Um, they look really amazing when I look at them like, wow, there's so much information in there. But how do we begin to think about using those in on the ground conservation? So I wanna go through a couple examples here. Um, this is a, a, a map, unfortunately it's kind of sideways, so you might have to tilt your head a little bit. But this is a map of California and the Central Valley in California, which is a, a, a huge agricultural district in, in the West. Um, and this bird returns project is a collaboration between the Nature Conservancy, uh, Point Blue, uh, NASA was involved about shorebirds and rice and how those two come together in the Central Valley, California. So um, what these groups did is they began to look at the abundance models that were derived from eBird data and combined a bunch of those uh, for shorebirds into this kind of um, think of it this this map we see on the left. Combine that with existing data about surface water and we're able to come up with these relative conservation values of, of all of these different places in the, in the Central Valley of California um, from the shorebird perspective. And shorebirds winter there so it's really just a certain time of year when they're um, there uh, in the in the Central Valley in the in the rice growing area, so these conservation groups are trying to figure out uh, how do we how do we make better habitat for these shorebirds when they're here, knowing that we can't go out and buy thousands and thousands of acres of of prime agricultural land and turn it into shorebird wintering habitat. So they figured out when the, when the shorebirds were there from the, from the models. And they realized that when the rice fields are, are fallow, is which is when the shorebirds are there, they're usually dry. So these rice fields are just big, dry areas of, of dirt. And using that, that um, uh, muddled areas of high priority, um, they started working with farmers in the Central Valley. And these farmers can actually place a bid, meaning that for X number of dollars that they get paid, they'll flood these fields and maintain a water level in these fields when they're normally dry. So the conservation groups pay for that flooding in these high priority areas of shorebird, and now there's shorebird habitat available when the shorebirds are there, and it ends up being a, a complete win-win with, with both the, uh, the farmers and the shorebirds themselves. And a simple graphic of shorebird density that was conducted to really show how dramatic a difference that that flooding um, has on the shorebird density in the Central Valley. The, the darker black are, are fields that have been flooded and these lighter gray are the, kind of the control areas or shorebird density in those fields that haven't been flooded. Another example I want to go through real quickly about a conservation success story that utilized eBird data is the tricolored blackbird. It's another California example. Um, so tricolored blackbirds, uh, go back. Um, have people noticed that they've been declining for a good while? And in 2004, a group of organizations um, gathered as much data as they could. They petitioned the uh, government for listing the tricolored blackbird under the Endangered Species Act. That listing effort failed in 2004. Um, they tried again in 2015. Um, at that point in time, the, uh, the proposal was, was pretty heavily criticized because there wasn't any um, reliable population models for this bird. So the, the group kind of um, <clears throat> re regrouped um, begin to gather all of the data that they were able to find. And this time they started to include the citizen science data from eBird into an uh, integrated population model. And they produced some graphics like this. And this is a cumulative uh, this isn't a 150 year loss, this is something that, <clears throat> excuse me, happened within a 10 year period, a 34% decline 
in the population of the species. And once they had those kind of uh, broader scale data, they were able to successfully get this tricolored blackbird listed under the Endangered Species Act. So it's now protected in the state of California. Success. And using eBird data and data, again, contributed by people like you and me, um, really kind of shows the scientific and the conservation value that can be derived from all of those contributions that, that um, are, are submitted from, from uh, bird watchers and hobbyists and nature enthusiasts around the world. So I like to intersperse um, talks with good pictures. Um, here's a picture of a beautiful endemic, one of those 171 endemics of the West Indies that Lisa mentioned. Um, so type in your chat windows, what species is this? And if you know what island this picture was taken on, bonus points. And I need to figure out how to open my chat window so I can see them. Okay, Jeff. So people are saying Antillean euphonia. Yep. Yep. I Banana see that. It was another guess, but uh, several people said euphonia. Yeah, you, it looks like most people are coming in euphonia. Um, Higuero in Spanish, that one I didn't know. Nice. Good job. Um, yes. This is uh, Antillean euphonia. Um, it's, this has a, a, a range of Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, and then all the way through the Lesser Antilles. Um, this was a Puerto Rican bird. Um, bird. And uh, I hope everybody on the call gets to go see one of these one of these days. So let's dive in a little bit into eBird and what you can do with it. Um, kind of given some conservation examples, but now I'd like to, to really kind of show you what you what you can see in eBird, how you can explore it, and what's available there on the on the site. Um, as you go to eBird, um, go to the eBird.org slash Caribbean website, and you can go to the Caribbean portal. Um, the first thing you'll see is something like this. Uh, it's a place where um, you can create an account, you can begin to monitor your stats, enter your sightings, and explore data that uh, are already existing in, in eBird. The first thing we want to do is, is create an account. So click on this uh, little link up here on the right. It will open a Create a Cornell Lab Account window. And type in your name, your email address, and uh, pick a username uh, and a password. Uh, sometimes uh, your first choice for uh, username is already taken. Sorry about that. Um, if you had a last name like Gerbrock, it wouldn't be much of a problem. But uh, if you have a name like Smith, sometimes it can be a little hard to find a unicorn. So once you do that, you go back to that home page. Um, you see up here that you're actually logged in. And it'll start to show um, kind of your stats or what your interactions have been with, with eBird itself. So let's dive into the explore data is really we can go in and see what eBird has to offer. Um, generally, there are two main ways of, of looking at data that are already in eBird, uh, looking at um, all the bird observations. One of those is, is by species. So we can go in and look at, uh, at all the information that's available for Antillian funia, or we can look at a region. And let's go in and look at what we have for the Dominican Republic. Um, here we see a list of all the species, it's 276 species have been observed in the Dominican Republic. And we see when they were la latest, most recently observed, who observed them. Um, also see things like uh, recent visits. So this kind of shows you um, who's been birding in the Dominican Republic recently and you can click on the data and actually see what they've been observing. So it's a great way of exploring a region. There's also this top eBirders for those who are a little competitive. Um, I think Lisa and I both might fall into that category. 
Um, looks like Steve Browning has seen the most spe species in the Dominican Republic. And thankfully, Steve's on the Flying Pintails Global Big Day team. And that is Lisa's team. So I'm confident that we can do well this coming Saturday. There's also this illustrated checklist, and I think it'd be good to look at that a little closer. Um, the illustrated checklist is similar. It's, it's all of the species that have been seen in the Dominican Republic, but there's a lot more information here to, that is available for, for both uh, people that are new to looking at birds as well as, as those who've been looking at birds for a long time. Um, you can go in and you can see, or you can listen, to sound recordings that have been um, recorded in the Dominican Republic. Um, you can see, oh, there's 68 species of birds that have never been photographed in the Dominican Republic, but that have been seen there. Maybe I, if I have a camera, I can go out and try to try to track down one of those and add to this data, add to the to this display of, of what's in the Dominican Republic. Um, you can also see a little more detail on, on individual species like this blue-winged teal. And I want to talk a little bit about what this, this um, what we call a bar chart or seasonality chart actually shows. So the, um, this is a chart throughout the year from January through to December. Um, the thickness of the green is is correlates with how frequent blue and teal is, is seen in the Dominican Republic for that week of the year. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go see one and you're in the Dominican Republic, you better get outside um, and find a pond in the next few days because they're about ready to disappear and they're head up north my way for the for the breeding season. Another thing that you can see here is this is this um, Thing called hotspots, and these are locations within the Dominican Republic that are kind of public birding sites, or it's where multiple people go um, traditionally to, to look for birds and to find birds or just to get outdoors. The Jardin Botanico Nacional is um, one of those hotspots. I'm going to click on that, and we can see almost the same display that we had for the Dominican Republic at this much finer grained level. So if, if you live in Santo Domingo and you're interested in seeing what you could see in the city, maybe this, uh, the Botanic Gardens is a great place to go to see what species are there. You can see West Indian Whistling Duck. It's been seen very recently. So one of Lisa's favorite birds. Um, we can really begin to see what's, what's um, in a region. 135 species total. Um, you can also see again the recent recent visits, top eBirders, there's Steve Browning again. You can also see a map of where this site is, is located. So let's dive into the species side of things. And here I, I uh, entered black whiskered vireo, which is a, uh, a bird that uh, is throughout the, the West Indies. Um, has identification text on this page to help you identify this species. Um, there's this great little listen to its song. Uh, many birds you, you um, can identify much easier by the sounds they make versus uh, by looking at field marks. Um, and with that, I think we're going to jump into the next quiz, which is also about sound. Which one of these do you need to hear to identify? And we did discuss this one earlier in the, in the, in the talk. A bonus if you know what, what the first one is. Wow, nobody's going for Nightingale or Gladys Knight mm -hmm. or Bull Roarer Took. All right, people keep voting. We got about 10 more seconds. For half the people. So far, Nighthawk is in the lead. Five more seconds. Keep voting, yeah. everybody. Get your votes in. At least I made these quizzes too easy. I think so. All right, three, <laughs> two, one. Hold on. 
Here are the results. Yes, Antillian nighthawk. That's right. That's the, the species that we don't really have a, a good idea of its, of its wintering range because it's so hard to identify. Um, and it overlaps with common nighthawk, which breeds in, in, in North America. Great, very good. Nobody picked Bull Roar or Tuck, who I think was a character, if I remember right, from The Hobbit. All right, so back to the black whiskered vireo. Um, you can also see when you, when you go in and look at an individual species, uh, and we're looking at, at the perspective of, of the Dominican Republic again, so you can see how many, um, how many observations that have been made of this, of this species, how many photographs and sound recordings. Um, you see a map. That, that shows where all the, the observations have been made of, of black whisker gray on, on Hispaniola. Um, you see that bar chart again. And um, you can also see a, a list of photographs and sound recordings. So this is a great place to go to uh, if you're trying to, to identify that video that you saw at the Botanic Gardens. It's a great place to go and you can really see a whole set of Different photographs, and you can even um, play the sounds if you if you heard the bird singing, and help you figure out um, whether the bird you saw was a black whiskered vireo. Other things on the explore data um, page uh, that I'll go through really quickly, um, and let you let everyone on the call explore these further at their leisure. First one I wanted to dive in though is the the species map. Um, here's that Antillian euphonia. Um, maybe a little hard to see on some of the screens, I'm not sure, but the more intense the purple is, uh, the more frequent that species is observed at that location. So you can see um, in the Antillian euphonia is seen throughout uh, Puerto Rico. It's also scattered around the Dominican Republic in Haiti, and then um, in the Lesser Antilles, um, but it doesn't seem to be in the Anguilla, British Virgin Islands, U.S. Virgin Islands area. So there's this gap in its in its in its range. <clears throat> you can zoom in on an area and actually see the individual points where this species has been seen. <clears throat> so if you really want to see an a uh, Antillian euphonia, you may want to go down to this area if you're in the Dominican Republic. Um, definitely don't see it very often in Santa Domingo. Um, there's a central mountain region where they're often seen as well. And here you can also click on any of these points and you can see the, um, how the, every observation that has been made of that species at that location. So this, this case is uh, the national parks here, the Atar Luco, and um, you can see every, every sighting of Antillian euphonia on and that maybe what's a little note icon. So that little photo icon means if you go in and look at that actual list that was done by Pete Red, Reed, um, there's photos actually in there that you can look at as well. Bar charts is another thing. We talked about these briefly, but this is a great view of, of the entire uh, list of species for a region. We can see that Antillian nighthawk uh, at the bottom definitely is there only in the summer. Um, and there is a little bit of overlap with common nighthawk, but common nighthawk, as you can see, would be really rare in the Dominican Republic. It's not a solid line across there. There's just been a few, a few sightings or a few weeks of the year where the, it's been, been observed. So for those of uh, you who might be listers or twitchers, um, or become serious bird watchers over time and, and really become a little competitive. Um, there's also ways to manage uh, alerts. So you can, you can be notified when there's a rare bird that appears in your region. Uh, something that I know Jack Black and Steve Martin and Owen Wilson probably would have appreciated in the big year. Um, because I think uh, in that movie, they actually had to call the hotline to figure out if there was anything, anything good about. So this is a great way um, as, as people become 
well, I might even say a little obsessive about about birding to to really see what's what's going on and, and see what interesting birds have, have appeared in the region. So I don't know if many people have seen the movie. I actually haven't yet. And I, I need to one of these days. Um, <clears throat> another little quiz bird for for typing in the chat. Again, this this one uh, Caribbean endemic. Um, and there's probably enough information here to know what island this bird is from as well. So go ahead and start typing in the in the chat window. <laughs> and Good somebody job. said that's Jeff's favorite bird. Thanks, Sean. Shannon. Somebody said they won't cheat. I won't tell you who because that's a big hint. <laughs> oh, uh oh! I didn't know my brother was on here. <laughs> Wow, but he got it right. Adrian, uh, yes, very close. So I'm, I'm seeing everybody's putting in Adelaide's or Barbuda or St. Lucia Warbler. And um, those all three used to be considered a single species. They do look a little different, um, but very subtly. Um, this one's actually a Barbuda Warbler endemic to a small island of, of Barbuda, which I uh, had, the, had the privilege of doing surveys when I was down there. Um, unfortunately, it was post-hurricane, so it, the story wasn't great, but it was, it was wonderful to see the bird. So let's get into submitting data a little bit, um, because your checklists do matter. Everything that, that, that I've shown you so far all the photos, all of the model results, everything has come from contributions uh, from birders just like you and I. So our, our checklists do really matter and, and can have an on the ground conservation impact in these, in these species. So one of the first things you wanna do when entering an observation is, is tell us where you're actually looking at birds. Um, if it's your first time in, um, this um, so I would suggest starting off with a map. And this time I'm going to pick St. Lucia. It displays uh, a map of St. Lucia with all of these various colored pins on it. Um, I can click on an area and this green mark will appear. Um, and that's when I want to create a, a brand new location. In other words, I'm in an area where nobody's really birded before. There's no public hotspots. So I can type in a location name and it will create a new location at that point. You can also pick, out, pick one of these blue dots, which is um, where I have birded before. Or we can pick one of these red ones, which are hotspots, similar to the botanic gardens in Santa Domingo, um, the example that, uh, that we went through earlier. In this case, that's the diamond, uh, diamond botanic garden. So we're gonna pick that. Um, put in the observation dates because we need to, um, to really be able to understand birds and bird populations and how they change. It's kind of where, when, what, and how are the, are the pieces of information that kind of go into the science behind um, conservation of, of birds and understanding what's happening with, with bird populations. So we put in a date, we pick an observation type, and this is kind of a how, is what were we doing? Were we standing in one place, like in our yard, or were we walking around a, a town or through a, um, through a trail in a forest? Um, when did we start birding? Um, how, sorry, how long was the duration? How long were we spending time? And if we traveled, how far did we go? And also this uh, party size is, were you out by yourself or were you in with, with uh, several other other people. Now that eBird knows when and where, um, it can generate a list of species that are likely to be observed um, on, on your birding trip. And here you can enter numbers um, right in these little boxes. So I can say I saw two common ground doves and one mangrove cuckoo. Um, sometimes these lists can get a little long, so I can type in Swift or SWI and I can actually jump to Black Swift in this list and very quickly um, type in numbers there. 
This question here, are you submitting a complete checklist of all the birds you were able to identify is really an important, really critical question. Um, this question allows scientists to know when to use this list for certain um, types of analysis. So if I say no to this, in other words, I'm not submitting everything um, and I've left rock pigeon blank, then the, the um, researchers that are wanting to use this information don't know whether rock pigeon was actually here at the Botanic Gardens or not. But if I say yes, I am submitting everything I saw, then those researchers um, looking at this list know that I did not see rock pigeon. And they can, they can use this, this um, checklist for modeling rock pigeon distribution. Whereas if I answered no to this, they wouldn't know whether rock pigeon was there or not. So they would not be able to use this. So that's a real critical question to, to, for us to think about and to, to enter as we're entering these lists. And you submit, and voila, it's in eBird Caribbean. Um, if you've taken photos, you can also add them at this point. You simply drag and drop them from your desktop right into this, this checklist. So that's doing it on the web, which means you kind of have to keep track in a notebook of everything you see while you're out in the field. It's much, much easier to use the app. And there is an Android and an iPhone app for entering eBird data. Um, and the great thing about that is, besides it being free, it's really easy to use and it does have the work for you. Um, one of the first things you want to do when you download the app is go to this um, settings page. And you'll need to go to settings and accounts, put in the username that you have created. And then if you're in the Caribbean, I would encourage everybody to change the portal to eBird Caribbean. So the Birds Caribbean has easy access to all of these data. The other thing is if you're going to be in an area with um, bad internet or where you don't have good cell coverage, you might want to consider downloading a pack for the region, which includes those lists of species and a, a lot of extra information like the hotspots for a region. So if you're outside of cell, cell coverage, the application still can, can show you um, nearby locations, nearby hotspots and give you a good species list. So let's go ahead and start. Um, all you do, we know the date. The phone already knows where you are and the date and time. So all of that is already figured out. You can just start on the checklist. And because of that, it jumps immediately to the list of species. Um, one of the great things about, about the, uh, the app is if I see five Zenata dove, I can just go up there, type in five space ZE, click um, or tap on Zenata dove, and it immediately increments and, and adds a count of five to my list. And if I go back and I see six more, I can do the same thing. I can type in six ZE, and it'll actually add those counts together. So it's a great way to keep a tally as you're, as you're birding. Um, alternatively, you can click on the plus sign and it increments each one of these by, by one. So then we have a list uh, of birds that we've seen and counts. Um, this little checkbox here, you can tap on it and it switches back and forth between a view of all of the species that are expected in a region and just those that you've entered numbers for. It's a really great way to review your list as you're, as you're um, walking. And then uh, this may happen sometimes. Um, you put something in that's unusual. In this case, I put in 15 brown trembler, which it would be very, very unusual. Um, it could be that I mistyped the species, or maybe I mistyped the count, or maybe I did actually observe 15 brown trembler. And if I did, then I want to go over, oops, sorry, jumped ahead too fast. Um, I want to go ahead and uh, tap on Brown Trembler. It'll open up this observation details little window. And there I can either adjust the account if I counted wrong, or I can delete the account if actually I mistyped it. But if I did see 15 Brown Trembler, then um, this is kind of giving me a hint that I should be uh, putting in detailed notes about how I identified this. 
how did I determine it was a brown trembler versus um, scaly breasted thrasher, for example? Um, because this it would be a very unusual sighting and, and um, the researchers that are utilizing this data, um, those details really help um, them determine um, what to do and, and how to incorporate these observations into their research. So then I click on stop. Uh, most of this is already filled out. It knows, the phone already knows that I was pretty stationary. I didn't walk around, how long I spent. I just set this yes or no uh, on whether I'm entering a complete checklist. In this case, uh, maybe I want to change the location um, so I can tap on the location name at the top. It brings up this extra little window where I can pick from nearby hotspots, or I can actually even view a map and, and pick locations from a map, just like I showed uh, earlier for the, for the website. And that's it. The data are entered and available to researchers and conservationists around the world. A couple other things quickly go through on the on the phone. Um, there's this checklists uh, section where you can actually look at all of the checklists that you've submitted, as well as those that you haven't. And here there are two checklists that I haven't submitted yet that have been on my phone for a long time. So I should probably look at those and think of submitting them. And also look at a My eBird section, and this is for Barbuda. And I can see that I saw 41 species in 2019, and I've seen 63 species total. I can actually click on that 63 species, and it'll show me the list of, of all of the birds I've seen on Barbuda and when I saw them. Um, jumping back to the eBird website, just very briefly, um, you can also see your lists on the on the eBird website. So you can see your life list if you're interested in that sort of thing, or lists for countries and states and major regions. Um, one of the other things that I'd like to point out is this your profile. It is kind of for those of you that are social and, and like to share what you do. Um, this is a great way to do it. Uh, this is a it has a, a display of all of your stats. Uh, how many checklists you've submitted, birds you've seen, that sort of stuff. You're going to edit the profile, which means you can go in and make it public. By default, these pages are private because we know uh, people are concerned about privacy, and that's really important. Um, but if you decide you want to make it public, you can. You can put in a little bio. There's even a URL that you can share with your family and friends so they can go to your, to, um, your profile page. And you can add a picture of yourself. And, and uh, here I'm just showing a little bit of Birds Caribbean swag with uh, one of my favorite hats, the, my Birds Caribbean hat. Um, I don't know if you can still get those through Lisa or not, but she, I'm sure, will talk about that. Um, this profile also shows recent checklists that you've entered, and if you've made any photographs or sound recordings, that's available there as well. Uh, I want to quickly go through some of the eBird best practices. We've kind of covered these before, but they're, they're good to reiterate. I'm trying to make complete checklists. In other words, list all of the birds that you know uh, for the scientific community and, and those that are really trying to generate models of bird abundance and distribution. List all the birds that you see in here and try to count the birds uh, as opposed to just saying, I saw. Rock pigeon, I say I observed 12 rock pigeon. It's much more useful for the science side of things. Also, um, one of the best practices is try to avoid long lists. 60-minute um, lists are, are good. Um, going out and, and doing a list for 12 hours um, becomes much less useful um, for the for the lists a couple kilometers long. And if you have major changes in habitat, if you're, if you're walking a, a road or a trail and there's major habitat changes, uh, consider starting a second list. And again, document those unusual sightings. And if you're interested, um, there's also uh, Bird Academy at the Ornithology Lab has an eBird Essentials course that is free. Um, probably presents a lot of this information better than I could ever do it. 
uh, it's worth 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 signing up and and going through that eBird Essentials um, <clears throat> course. And with that, we'll jump into a third quiz. What color is my Birds Caribbean hat? And if anybody knows why they call it polka dots, I'd be interested in that as well. All right, everybody get your votes in. I'll give you about 10 more seconds. We'll test your memories. Although maybe if you're colorblind, you could have had a little difficulty making out the color. <laughs> What are people picking white for? <laughs> yeah, it could be. All right. So yes, this is this is actually my hair. It's not a hat. Just <laughs> so people know. Fifty-three percent said blue. Thirty-three green. It's actually green, but I guess you could call it blue green. Um. Maybe I don't know. There it is. Is that blue or green, Lisa? I think it's green. I think it's green too. Yeah. <laughs> but it's hard to tell. So the last thing I wanted to go through quickly is Merlin, which is a different um, free app that's available. And think of that, think of Merlin as kind of a field guide on your phone. That's how I like to think about it. Um, if you download Merlin, uh, one of the first things you want to do, and, and it will actually ask you to download uh, what's called a pack. And if you're in the Caribbean, uh, download the Caribbean pack. This includes photos and sound recordings of over 500 species in the, in the Caribbean region. Um, covers all of the endemics. So Merlin has a couple of great little bird ID features for those that are, are new to birding or even those that aren't, but they might be in an area where they're not familiar with all the birds. That's a five, five question or five step uh, program. Enter where you are, um, when, when you were there, when did you see the bird, um, what size the bird was. In this case, I'm picking somewhere between a robin and a crow. Uh, what are the major colors you see on that bird? Pick white, red, and green. And what was the bird doing? Was In this case, it was in a tree or a bush. Because I'm in Cuba and I've entered all this data, Merlin taps into that eBird, those eBird bar charts, um, and, it, and it understands how frequent these different birds, how frequently are they observed in, in let's say Cuba and, and the data I selected. And for this case, the, the most likely suspect is uh, Cuban trogon, which actually is the one I was, I was hoping it would return. Um, so it's a great little tool for very quickly getting to a list of, of possible species that um, in a region, if you're trying to figure out what, what kind of bird you're looking at. Um, I mentioned it's also kind of a field guide on the on the on the phone. You can actually put in, in this case, um, Guadeloupe um, and a date. Um, sorry, I have two screens here, so I'm maybe looking away from the camera intermittently. Um, and it filters that list down to all of the species that have been observed in Guadeloupe for that date, which is today. So this is a great way to, um, especially for regions where um, species move around. Uh, or they're very seasonal to, to get a list of uh, species that would be expected in that region for that day. And then you can click on the species, gives you a little bit of identification text as well as sound recordings so you can see and hear um, and help you identify what, the, what you're seeing out there in the, in the world. And then lastly, uh, you can take pictures with your phone. You can take pictures uh, with your phone through your binoculars. If you have a camera that you're using to take pictures of birds, you can take, a, take your phone, take a picture of the back of the camera. Um, so you can take a picture of a picture even. And Merlin has a great photo ID feature where it, it steps through and, and it will actually identify using 
face recognition techniques that were developed by Google um, to identify the bird from a photograph. So I would encourage everybody download the eBird app, download Merlin. They're great tools for, for um, global big day and for any other day when you're out looking at birds. And remember, Global Big Day is this Saturday. I hope to see everybody who's on this call today, virtually, of course, um, through eBird. And thank you so much for all of your time today, and I appreciate it. And with that, um, if you want to type in the chat window one last quiz. What is this one, and what country is it from? And then we can uh, take questions. Great, thank you, Jeff. That was excellent. We do have some questions. Um, yep, this is not a quiz, so type in your answer into the chat window if you know what this bird is, or on Facebook you can type in in the comments what this bird is. Give you a few more seconds. Getting some good answers. Mm -hmm. And we do have time for a few questions. So um, yeah. hang in there. there's a few things that we'd like to discuss with you if you have time to hang in for a little bit longer. And we will make this recording available as well. We'll put it on our YouTube channel. It will be available on Facebook. We'll put it on our website. So if you joined late or you want to review anything at another time, you can, you'll be able to access this webinar again. Right. So, all right, Jeff. Seeing lots of Spindalis. That's right. This one's actually Western Spindalis. I think this is the Cuba. This photo was taken in Cuba. But uh, the Spindalis are, as I think my brother said, striped-headed tanagers. Um, they look a lot alike. Um, but if you know what island you're on, then that's, that narrows it down, because there's only one on each island. Great. Okay. Well, thanks, Lisa. So. Thanks, everybody. And yeah, so wait, let me it, ask you it, several um, questions. Happy to try to answer questions. Sure. Yeah, here's some really good questions. Let's go through them one by one. Natalia from Antigua is wondering, can Merlin be used offline? Yes. Um, in fact, it's, it's designed totally to be offline. So if you download that Caribbean pack, um, yeah, it's, it's all of the data, all of the bird lists and audio and video is all there. Um, I believe that even the five question bit will work in the photo ID, which is a, 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 a sort of works offline. So yeah, it's it's designed to be, to work offline. Great. great, thanks thanks for that question, Natalia, and welcome. Okay, and um, Anna Roman from Puerto Rico is asking, can you suggest a good field guide for Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands? You mean besides Merlin? <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably, Lisa, you may have a good, good idea too. Um, okay, so I have this guide, which is, are you familiar with this one? It's a very nice guide, beautiful photographs. It's by Mark Oberall, it's got a CD uh, at the end. I think that has bird calls, so I would recommend this one. Very good yeah, information. The, the Oberly guide is a good one, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then this is a classic. You may already have this, Anna, or some people probably have this on their shelves. Um, I've been in touch with Herb Raphael recently, and he's working on a revised and updated edition of this book. So that's fantastic, because this one is quite old. But it's another really excellent book for Puerto Rico. I hope that helps. All right, here's another question. Um, Emma is asking, who decides mm -hmm. what is a hot spot? So maybe explain again what a bird hot spot is. Yeah. Right, so birding hotspot is really any, any public location that um, multiple people um, would, would probably want to bird at or that multiple people have, have visited and bird watched. When you actually go through and create a location, there's a little checkbox there that I, that I didn't detail that says um, suggest this location as a hotspot. Um, and that goes into a queue that um, 
we have a, a big volunteer network of, of people that, that look at those rare, bird alert, rare birds, um, like the 15 brown trembler, and they also look at those hotspot suggestions. Um, so if there's places that, that you frequent and other people frequent in your region, I would encourage you to create a location or go into those locations in, on the eBird website and suggest them as hotspots. Um, and if you can't quite figure that out, um, it may not be obvious sometimes. Um, certainly contact Lisa or myself um, and we can, we can help with that process too. But it's really suggestions from, from all of you that define what those hotspots are. Yep. Okay, so like in Jamaica, that would be like Burnt Hill Road in cockpit country or Eccles Down Road, places like right. that are obvious. Right. Lots of other good ones that yeah. people know less about and it would be good to flag them on the map so that people know that they're good places to go birding. Right. Uh, so let's see, um, Susan Lowe's is asking, if you have multiple observers, how do you control for that in your data analysis? Ah, good question. So um, one thing I didn't show, um, I'm trying to think of it's an easy thing to pop out and, and maybe show on the website um, or on the phone. But as you go through it, especially on the phone, if you um, say there were two or three observers instead of one, there's a little uh, link that pops up that says share, share your list. And then you can easily share that list that you enter with other eBirders. And in the, in the database behind the scenes, all of those shared lists are tied together. So the researchers know that that was all one, one group of, of people that were birding together. And they can combine those data into basically one big checklist and analyze it from that perspective. Right, that's great. It's really helpful for when um, you want to go birding and everybody doesn't have to keep their own list. One person can keep the list and then share it with everybody. Right, and if you're a birding guide, it's a, it's a wonderful way to, to share that list with um, your customers, your clients, mm -hmm. um, the people that are out birding with you. Um, if you add photos to it, it just makes it even that much more compelling for the they, they remember they remember that and remember you and, and yeah. recommend you to, to all of their their friends as well okay all right so um somebody asked is it still useful to upload non-complete lists even if complete checklists are preferred similarly is it useful to upload checks checklists from past years uh short answer is yes and yes um Yes, they are. The incomplete lists are certainly useful, and they they will be used for the species that are on the list um, for for some modeling results or for some modeling processes. Um, historic data is um, fantastic. The the as you can as you saw from the the graph I I displayed at the very beginning, most of those lists in that increase our current lists and that, that big curve that I showed um, of the um, submissions of, of lists since eBird was released. Most of those lists have been since 2002 and most of them have actually been in the last three or four years. Um, so historic data is sparser and the more we have, the, the better we're able to model uh, trends in these populations over time, absolutely. Yeah, I've got lists from years and years ago, uh, birding places, and I still need to <laughs> those because again, it's historical data and it's valuable. And I might not yep. have all the details, but you know, if I'm documenting that a species occurred somewhere and now it's no longer there, then then that's very valuable information. Right. Uh, let's see. So another question. Um, this is from Emma, and she said that. She had the experience using eBird. She says, we spotted a fairly rare bird on a birding trip, but didn't get a photo. And I guess the observation was rejected, although it was in the right habitat and the description was quite detailed. Uh -huh. so Portmore sewage ponds in St. Catherine, Jamaica, one of the very few places it is seen, a yellow crowned bishop. And she said that um, their guide, Ricardo Miller, 
who we know well identified it. So the sighting was rejected though. So what, do you have any comment about that? And um, how are these decisions made? Yeah, so decisions are made generally by, by local experts. Um, and I scratched my head a little bit because I thought Ricardo was reviewing the Jamaica records. So um, <clears throat> I'd have to look at that one specifically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, I think he wouldn't reject his own um, record, but sometimes there's taxonomic changes too that happen over time and bird, bird names change as well. Um, but the, the process is that there are local experts who kind of set what those unusual birds are or unusual counts, and then they look at the um, photos or the documentation that's provided and make their best call on, on, on whether the, the sighting is, is, is good or not. One of the great things about that is that those records are never deleted. Um, and they can always be revisited over time um, as, you know, maybe, maybe in this case, as that, as that species becomes more established and more frequently seen, um, Ricardo or somebody will go back in and, and look at those older records again and say, you know, this is actually right. Um, and maybe some of the first records of, of, uh, of an invasion of, of a species like the, the bishop. Mm -hmm. um, I I should probably take a look at that though too. Right. Yeah. But we can ask Ricardo. Yeah. Right. And it and also definitely. raises a good point that when you see birds, and especially if you're a beginner birder and you're not sure what you're seeing, take pictures of everything, because you never know if you might see a rare bird. You go to your field guide to figure it out, and and you documented something rare, but you're not sure. So if you have that photograph, even if it's a lousy photograph, sometimes that can provide the verification that's needed, you know, a photo or video to say, right. yes, you know, experts can look at your record and say, yeah, absolutely, you saw so-and-so. So, -and -so. so um, photographs are really important for validating species, especially new species seen in an area where they're not normally seen. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so um, Emma asks a great question. Oh, Jennifer, she says, I think you recommended that counts be limited to 60 minutes, but this is a big day. What if I spend three hours sitting on my deck looking and counting? Um, you can do, you absolutely spend three hours on your deck counting, enjoying a glass of wine. Um, the data are much more useful if they're split up. So maybe start a new, a new checklist every hour. You don't have to go somewhere else. Um, but the, the data are certainly more useful. Um, one of the things that, that some of the researchers are looking at is, is, um, uh, um, blanking on the, uh, the blanking on the the name of it, but how there's a curve of new species that you see over time when you when you bird a, a certain location accumulation curve, mm. and um, multiple checklists even at the same location really kind of of inform that kind of uh, uh, information about accumulation curves. Um, which then can be applied to all the other checklists from the same region um, to kind of understand what is the accumulation curve of that of that's that's normal for the habitat in the region that you're in. So I would encourage you to just break break those up into hour long, into three hour long checklists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you do a three hour checklist, that's that's okay too. But okay. they'll be much more useful if they're if they're broken up into smaller time frames. Very good advice, thanks, Jeff. And yeah, if you're home all day, you know, maybe do 30 minutes or an hour or two in the morning, go back later in the morning, you know, early afternoon, evening. If you bird at different times of the day, you might get new and different species, which right. is great too. Yep. All right, so Jennifer also asks us, if somebody is quarantining and watching a feeder, how would you recommend figuring out a number? Is that the same red-bellied woodpecker over and over? Mm, that's a really good question. And, um, that it's probably better to be safe and to, if you see a male red-bellied woodpecker and you see five distinct times when it's at the feeder, um, I would probably count that as one and not five. Uh, er, I would err on the conservative side. If you, obviously, if you see multiples at the feeder at the same time, then you're pretty safe on the count. But um, 
chickadees are an interesting case where you might see four or five at a feeder, but there's actually four or five different flocks that are around the house. Then you end up, um, you'll never know it unless you ban them, but there'll actually be 40 or 50 chickadees that might be coming to your feeder and you'll never see more than five or six at a time. Hmm. But for woodpeckers, they're, they're pretty territorial, so um, it would be unusual to see five five different red-bellied woodpeckers coming into a, into a feeder. So mm. I, I would say just be conservative on, on that side of things. Yeah. Uh, okay, another question. Um, Bridget asks, when I upload a photo to a list someone who birded with me submitted, my name does not show on the recent visits page. So is it the person that submitted the checklist whose name shows? It's usually the, the, the person that submitted the checklist and that's, I, I assume you're referring to a shared list. I have to look into that because I thought that all, all the lists would show up there. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah, something you, I'll, I'll I know when you go to a map and you click on the on the um, you know the balloon, it does show even the person that entered the checklist and everybody else that shared it with them. Right. It shows it there. So um, right. But so if you, yeah, definitely. If you click on the checklist itself, you can see everybody yeah. that was on the list. Right. But maybe not on the home page for for the recent visit. Maybe yeah. the person that submitted it. Right. Let me look at that. Maybe my recollection is off. All right. Uh, so Shauna asks, um, says, Jeff, so happy for the Caribbean pack. When will we be able to add photos on eBird using the app? Kind of tedious having to go to the website to add them after. Mm, that's a good question. Um, and I wish I had, uh, I wish I could give you a date or a time, but I can't. There's, there's um, a number of things that are on the development priority list. Um, uploading photos is definitely one of them. And I know that, that there has been some development work on the mobile side to, to uh, enable, to allow that, to allow photos to be uploaded. But I don't offhand so they have a time frame on when that might, and it don't hold me to that. Okay, great. Good to know it's coming. Um, Ali Olivier asks, can you show people how to make their eBird public profiles for our bird guides that are sharing their profiles? Um, yes, yeah, so if you go to that profile page, let me, <clears throat> I have no idea what's going to show up on, on the screen now that I jumped out. You should be able to all my close. hundreds of, of tabs <laughs> that Lisa harasses me about. <laughs> you have too many tabs open. So if I go to that profile page, uh, Is my voice okay coming through? Because I know my internet is not the best. It was a little bit slow and distorted here and there, but not too bad. Okay, that might be just me. <laughs> so if you go to this edit profile, um, where you can, you can put in a photo, um, you can even put a URL to your own website if you'd like. Um, you put in a little bio, you can change the default region from the world and there's this checkbox here you can make your profile public you can also if you want to make your public profile public but you don't want to show like where you've been recently you can turn your profile page but this is where you would, would set that so just go for, go to the profile page and just click on this edit profile link great all right, so let's see. I think I have covered everybody's questions. If there's any more, please put them in the chat window or the Q&A. If I missed any, let me know. Jessica, do you see any questions that I've missed? Are there any from Facebook? I don't think I saw any there. 
But yes, again, for Global Big Day, if you're just staying home, do hourly checklists. That's what Jeff recommends. Start a new checklist every hour. Uh, and then just in general, you know, the protocol types. What does that say? Sorry, my daughter just made this for me. She's taken up sewing. Oh, wow. It's a little uh, C3PO. Cool. Not a bird. <laughs> so yes, um, you would check stationary protocol. If you're sitting in your backyard, if you're walking around your neighborhood, you would check travel and count. And um, if, you're, if you're out and you just happen to see an interesting bird or rare bird, you're not really doing a count, also enter that as an incidental checklist. So that would, by definition, not be a complete checklist, but it's like if you want to document that you saw a broadwing hawk at a certain place that you've never seen it before. You know, maybe you're in your car and, and you happen to see it. Right. That's a good choice for that checklist. Uh, any good. last words of advice, Jeff, for Global Big Day? Um, stay safe, have fun, um, and enjoy. See some birds, even if they're from your, from your backyard. Yes, we hope everybody, no matter what or where you are, you'll be able to do some birding, enjoy the day, get outside. Um, we have, I think, a nor'easter forecast. It's going to be windy and rainy and miserable. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm supposed to get, we're supposed to get snow. Oh, that's crazy. That's crazy. So, so um, anyway, you guys, snow, everybody snow, have snow. fun. Here. Have fun. Try to see some birds. Let's get as many Caribbean countries and U.S. states and Canada, everywhere all over the world, participating so we can beat the record from last year in terms of number of birds seen on one day, number of checklists. Yep. And we always publish the stats about um, the Caribbean, which country has submitted the most checklists, which country has seen the most birds. So um, it's on you guys to set a good example and, um, and share with all your... Um, friends and colleagues in each of your countries and get them birding as well. And if you're interested, join one of our teams on our Global Big Day fundraising page. Any of the teams would love to have more Caribbean members or members from anywhere for that matter. So uh, join us and um, help us fundraise for Birds Caribbean and science and conservation. We would love that. So uh, thanks everybody. And thanks again to Jeff. As I said, we'll have this webinar. Thanks everyone. To see you again. Uh, it's take care, stay safe, and we look forward to hearing about your Global Big Day. You can share photos with us using the hashtag Global Big Day Caribbean, and we will try to share as many of those as we can on our Facebook and Instagram and, and Twitter. So keep in touch with us about what you're seeing. Great. Care, everybody. Thanks, Bye -bye. Lisa. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks a lot, everybody. Take care.